So, so today we're going to talk about some advanced topics about zero knowledge. Um, so I'm going to start uh, uh, with a quick recap of what we discussed about interactive proofs and zero knowledge. Then I'm going to talk about zero knowledge for NP, and in the last part of the talk, uh, of the lecture, we're going to talk about uh, something about proofs of knowledge. So uh, uh, just one comment before we get started. So uh, uh, I'm using slides. I'm going to uh, post them. You can use them afterwards. Uh, so this means that you don't need to understand my handwriting. It means that you don't need to maybe copy as much. But you do have uh, an additional responsibility, which is to keep the pace of the lecture kind of uh, uh, slow enough, not too fast. So if there's anything that is not clear, of course, stop me and ask a question. And also, if you just need to like take a moment and think about something that I said or something that is written on the slide, just stop me and ask me to wait or, or to repeat, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. So any questions? OK, so let's start with a, a quick recap of uh, the definitions of interactive proofs and zero knowledge. So the next few slides are going to be mainly about the finishes. They're going to be a bit dry. So if you get bored, just remember uh, all the uh, wonderful introduction and motivation that I'm sure Vinod and Shafi gave you about interactive proofs and your knowledge. They're kind of changing the way we think about proofs. Suddenly, they're uh, uh, probabilistic and interactive, and they don't have to convey knowledge of why the statement is correct. And they have all of these far-reaching applications in uh, crypto that you must have discussed or you're going to discuss uh, in the future. So does this ring a bell, right? Good. So you discussed motivation of interactive proofs, you're not. OK, so let's just recall uh, what it is. So in interactive proof, we have a prover and a verifier, and they're having some conversation. The prover is trying to convince the verifier <laughs> of some statement. Uh, 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 X is an L. And uh, um, it, this proof system should have some basic properties. First of all, we want it to be complete. So if the statement is really correct, if x is an L, then the prover will manage to convince the verifier to accept with probability 1. So this notation right here means that the graphics denotes the random variable, which is the interaction of the prover and the verifier. And uh, uh, x is kind of a common input to both parties. And uh, uh, um, the output of this uh, uh, experiment is just the output of the verifier after the interaction. And 1 means that the verifier accepts. And we want this to happen uh, with probability 1 when the statement is true. And uh, the more interesting property is soundness. So uh, if x is not in the language, if the statement is false, then no cheating prover, even if it's not following the protocol, will manage to convince the verifier to accept with probability more than half. And uh, this threshold, 1 half, is chosen pretty arbitrarily because if you want to reduce this probability, this soundness error uh, uh, below half, you can just repeat the protocol maybe sequentially many times, and the soundness error will reduce exponentially. So any questions about this? Good. So, uh, uh, so one thing that uh, uh, you may have discussed is what is the power of interactive proof? What is the set of languages that we can uh, uh, have interactive proof for? What statement can we convince uh, uh, a verifier of? So this famous theorem of uh, Shamir, IP is equal to P space, you mentioned this. Have you seen this? So the point is that interactive proofs are surprisingly powerful. They can prove statements that are way outside of NP, statements that we don't really have a short witness for. So for example, you can prove, convince a verifier that uh, uh, certain graphs are not isomorphic to each other. You can convince a verifier that you know uh, an optimal strategy for chess. These are things that there is no like a simple short string that you can write down that will convince the verifier. But using this notion of interactive proof, uh, we can prove uh, uh, the correctness of every language in P-space. They're extremely powerful. That sounds familiar. Did you discuss this in a previous class? Maybe. Maybe not. Nobody knows. Okay. So today we're going to kind of put aside this extra power of interactive proof, and we are going to focus on interactive proofs for NP statements. So what do I mean by interactive proofs for NP statements? We're going to think about languages that are in, that are in NP. For example, satisfiability. We want to prove that a certain formula is satisfiable, and we're going to, in these examples, the prover has to be inefficient. It has to be able to decide these complicated languages and much more. But when we're talking about interactive proofs for NP, we do want the prover to be efficient given a witness for the statement. So if the prover is efficient, it cannot decide if the formula is satisfiable or not. 
but it's getting some witness, some satisfying assignment, and using this witness, it should be able to convince the verifier. So when we're talking about interactive proofs for NP, we're thinking about a prover and a verifier that are both efficient. The only difference between the prover and the verifier is the prover knows a witness for why the statement is correct. That's clear? So now, uh, 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 the first uh, uh, theorem that we're going to state is that every language in NP has a very simple interactive proof. So what's the interactive proof for this language, for example? Just provide the witness. The prover can just send the verifier the witness. Uh, this witness is, uh, this will give us completeness and soundness just because of the definition of the witness. The witness is still missing. Uh, it doesn't require interaction. It doesn't require randomness. It's just one message. So why do we even bother uh, uh, talking about interactive proof for NP? So maybe this uh, uh, extra power of interaction can give us something beyond just completeness and soundness. Specifically, we're going to talk about the zero knowledge property. We're going to uh, discuss proof where the prover just doesn't just give away the witness. In fact, it keeps the witness secret. It doesn't tell the verifier anything about why the statement is correct. So uh, the completeness of soundness properties remain the same, and now we add on top of this an additional property called zero knowledge. So I'm assuming you've seen this before. If you haven't, this is going to be very confusing, but we'll try to break it down a little bit. So for every probabilistic polynomial time, so efficient verifier that can flip coins, which is non-uniform, so this just means that we're thinking about this verifier as a sequence of polynomial size circuits and for every uh, input size, for every statement, we can have a, a, a different circuit. The circuit can contain what we call an advice or a, a, any non-uniform information that is specific to this input length. So for every probabilistic polynomial time, non-uniform cheating verifier, V star, there exists a, an efficient a machine that we call a simulator. And uh, the job of the simulator is to produce the view of this cheating verifier when it's interacting with the honest prover. So here we have a random variable that describes, so, so we're going over a sequence of statements x, which are in the language. And we are looking at the view of the verifier when it's interacting with the honest prover, given the, the real witness. And we want to say that our simulator, even though it doesn't know a witness for the statement, it just knows the statement, it can produce something that is indistinguishable, computationally indistinguishable from the view of the verifier in this interaction. So just if this uh, notion of like these ensembles parameterized by x and this computational indistinguishability is uh, maybe still uh, not sitting uh, well enough, then this is what it means, just in different, these two statements are equivalent, this is just notation. So for every uh, efficient distinguisher, or for every distinguisher d, uh, uh, and for every statement, uh, we want that the difference between the probability that the distinguisher accepts the uh, output, the view of the verifier in this interaction, and it accepts the simulated view, the difference between these two probabilities are negligible. So every event, every bit of information that you can learn from these random variables, uh, 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 the probability that you learn this information here and here is the same. So this Notation-wise, this definition is familiar, is it okay? Is there any question about this? This would be a good time to stop and maybe ask a question. Okay, so uh, uh, just to remind us, uh, uh, um, what is the intuition here? So the simulator is kind of the alter ego of the verifier. Whatever the verifier can learn from the conversation, uh, uh, the simulator is, uh, 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 represents what the verifier could do by itself, alone, back at home, with no interaction with the prover, the, the verifier can always execute the simulator and learn exactly the same information uh, just by itself. So in this case, uh, 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 this would mean that the proof, interacting with the prover, does not convey any additional knowledge. Yeah? What's W? So W is uh, uh, the witness for the fact that X is an L. Okay? So this definition only works uh, for statements that are true. And in fact, part of the definition is, uh, is talking about this view, this interaction with the honest prover. The honest prover, in order to prove the statement, has to have a witness. More? Awesome. Okay, so this has been very fast. I'm assuming that uh, you kind of remember what is your knowledge and what is it good for. I'm not going to repeat uh, any of the motivation. 
the only thing I do want to uh, say is some kind of more advanced remarks about this definition. And we're going to use these uh, kind of uh, 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 comments today when we're going to build some simulators. So first of all, without loss of generality, when you build a simulator, what you need to do is simulate the verifier's view in the interaction. So you don't just need to simulate the verifier's output. You uh, 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 might as well uh, simulate the verifier's view. So the view of the verifier consists of its random coins, if it flips any coins, and all of the messages that it receives during the protocol. If you have the messages that uh, the verifier receives and you have its random coins, you can also compute the messages that the verifier sends and the final output of the verifier. You can just emulate the entire conversation. So why I'm saying this, uh, 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 without loss of generality, you need to simulate the entire view. Because now we're talking about the cheating verifier. It doesn't just output one bit, I accepted the proof, I rejected the proof. A cheating verifier is trying to learn as much as possible from this conversation. So it might just, uh, there is a cheating verifier that just outputs its entire view, and maybe even more, maybe even something that it deduces from this view. But as long as you can simulate the view, you can just execute the verifier and get the output distribution. Is this clear? So without loss of generality, when we need to simulate a verifier, we're just trying to simulate its view. Random coins and all the messages that it sends and receives. We're going to talk about, so the, we usually relax the definition of zero knowledge and talk about uh, what's called expected polynomial time uh, uh, simulation. So uh, uh, we think about the simulator is a, uh, is a random, uh, is a probabilistic machine, and its running time, it doesn't have to be upper bounded by some fixed polynomial. It could be a random variable and uh, it depends on the coins of the simulator. And we usually just require that the expected running time of the simulator is polynomial. This is uh, not equivalent, it's weaker, but usually this property uh, will be enough for us. And uh, this is the type of simulators that we're going to construct today. Sometimes you can turn such simulators into a, a real strict polynomial time simulator. Sometimes we, uh, we're good with expected poly time, okay? The last thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, why did we uh, insist on having verifiers in the definition that are non-uniform? Why did we insist on working with uh, circuits rather than maybe Turing machine? So there are several reasons why uh, working with verifiers that are non-uniform is uh, kind of better and stronger and more convenient for us. I'm just going to list the reasons. I'm not going to tell you uh, any proof. But uh, uh, we're going to use these facts uh, during the lecture. If you want to prove this, then either try to do it as an exercise or talk to me. I'll refer you to some book chapters. And this is a, a kind of, there's a lot of literature about this. So first of all, uh, uh, if you're thinking about non-uniform verifiers, then without loss of generality, you can just assume that the worst verifier that you need to simulate is deterministic. It doesn't flip any coins. This is useful when you're trying to prove something, or trying to construct a simulator. So if you don't have a, a, a non-uniform advice for the verifier, if you're just talking about uniform machines, then you have to uh, approve simulation both for probabilistic verifiers and deterministic verifiers. When we're talking about a non-uniform model, it's enough to consider deterministic verifiers. This is, uh, it captures everything. Also, we'll see that uh, if our verifiers are non-uniform, this definition of zero knowledge is actually equivalent to a slightly stronger definition where the simulator is universal. So here, we want it for every cheating verifier there exists a simulator. The orders of quantifier is first verifier, then simulator. But actually, this definition implies a stronger definition where there is one simulator that works for all verifiers. Okay? And we'll see this when we construct a simulator. There will be one simulator that works for all verifiers. Of course, different verifiers learn different things. The simulation depends on the verifier. The simulator will have to just use the verifier internally. It will just execute the verifier, it will simulate its view, and execute the verifier, see what it outputs. But the simulation process will be the same for all verifiers. And to prove this equivalence, we actually use non-uniformity. Uh, and finally, if you want to uh, prove that the zero-knowledge property is preserved under sequential composition, you need to work with this non-uniform definition. So uh, uh, it will be enough. If you think about the proof system that is, uh, has parallel repetition, it's just the same proof many times in parallel, in a, a sequentially, repeated sequentially, then it's enough for you to prove that one copy of this proof is zero knowledge. And then you can use the simulator for this one copy of the proof to simulate the entire uh, sequential uh, interaction. And in order to prove this, we have to use non-uniformity. So I'm not going to prove it. It's not very complicated. But the main idea is that 
if you're thinking about the ith repetition of the protocol, then the verifier in this repetition already seen all the messages in the previous i minus one's executions, and it can use all of these messages as kind of advice. So if you want to think about the code of this verifier, it has to include all of these messages inside. This is why we use non-uniform advice or a circuit. So this has been very technical comments about, uh, uh, about simulation. If you completely forget about this comment and just kind of roll with the, uh, with the rest of the lecture, I think you won't really get stuck. But we're going to use these details. If you try to kind of fully expand all the proofs here, you're going to uh, kind of stumble upon these points. Okay? But if something is not clear here and bugs you, you can kind of put it aside and think about it after the lecture. Questions? Okay, so you're pretty quiet. So <laughs> maybe just dummy questions will help me. Okay, so uh, uh, today we're going to talk about constructing zero knowledge protocols for uh, all of NP. So uh, I think you mentioned uh, 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 the protocol for quadratic residuosity, which is a specific language, it's not NP complete. And you started talking about a protocol for the free coloring language, which is NP complete. And uh, today we're going to kind of go through the full details of this protocol. Uh, um, so we're going to repeat the protocol and, and, and see the proof. So just as a reminder, why is it enough to, uh, um, to uh, why, wh why do we call it zero knowledge proofs for NP what, when we're just constructing the protocol for the free coloring language? So free coloring is NP complete, which means that for every other language in NP, there is a reduction uh, 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 between, uh, from uh, uh, this language to free coloring. So for every, uh, there is a reduction that takes any uh, instance in uh, whatever language you want, and translates into an instance of free coloring, into a graph, such that x is an L if and only if uh, uh, this new uh, graph, R of x, is free colored. Okay? So we're going to use both of the directions. So now the protocol, if you want to construct a protocol for any NP language, how do you construct it? So say that you have a zero knowledge protocol for free coloring and you want to construct a zero knowledge protocol for a language L. How are you going to use this reduction? What is going to be the protocol for L? Fantastic. So if you have uh, some protocol pi for free coloring, and now we want to construct the protocol pi prime for L, uh, we just take our instance. We first, both the prover and the verifier apply this reduction R, and uh, both of them get the same uh, 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 graph. Now they just run the original protocol pi, and the prover convinces the verifier that this graph is free colorable. And uh, uh, by the uh, uh, properties of the reduction, this means that x is in L, whatever the original language you started with. So we're using the fact that if x is in L, uh, this graph is free carbon. We're using this direction of the uh, implication for completeness. Okay? If we have a witness for the statement, we also have a witness, a coloring for this graph. And we're using the other direction of the implication to prove soundness. If x is not in L, then this graph is going to be uh, not colorable. And by the soundness of our protocol, the prover will not be able to convince the verifier. So we're using both of these directions for completeness and soundness. OK, so you should be comfortable with uh, using free coloring or N any NP-complete languages. Uh, uh, and we just need to design a zero-knowledge protocol for that. We're choosing this language because it has some specific structures that will be convenient for us to work. So we're going to start with uh, kind of a warm-up. We're going to see uh, not a real uh, a pr digital proof where the prover and verifier exchange messages. We're going to start with kind of a physical proof where uh, the verifier and prover are in the same room and they're kind of using props uh, uh, to run this protocol. So let's see uh, how this works. So we'll start with the physical proof and then we'll kind of translate it into a real digital proof. So the prover and verifier uh, have some graph in mind, some statement. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that the graph is colorable. So first the verifier leaves the room. Okay? And the prover has a color, and he just colors the uh, nodes of the graph with uh, know, a marker or something. And uh, uh, of course, before the verifier comes back in the room, the prover needs to kind of hide this coloring. He doesn't want to give it away. It's a zero knowledge protocol. So the first thing the prover does is permute the color. So every uh, red becomes blue, every green becomes uh, 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 red, and so on. And it's used in a random permutation of the colors. Okay? So the verifier has no idea what's this permutation. So why are we using a random permutation? What does it give us? 
So because this permutation is random, no matter what coloring the prover started with, if you look just at an individual node, you ignore the rest of the graph, you look at the color of just one node, this color is uniformly random, right? Not only that, if you take an edge, it has two different colors on it. These two colors are both independent and uniformly random, no matter what color you started with. So if, no matter what is the initial coloring, if you just fix two arbitrary colors for this edge, you can kind of complete the rest of the coloring. This defines a permutation, right? Whatever color you started with is going to blue, and here it's going to green, and the last color is going to red, and this kind of defines a permutation for us, and it kind of com can complete the coloring of the rest of the graph. So every edge you look at, just two colors that look uniformly red. So this will be uh, useful for us. So the prover starts by permuting the colors with a random permutation, and then it puts like these black squares over the colors, it hides the colors, uh, uh, so the verifier uh, can now come back into the room and it doesn't see anything. It just sees these, this graph, it knows it's the graph uh, uh, that uh, uh, it's interested in. And, uh, 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 and now what the verifier does, it just samples one random edge in this graph. And uh, the prover will remove the uh, uh, black squares from the two endpoints of this edge. Right. So now the verifier can uh, actually check that uh, uh, both of the endpoints are colored with different colors. That's all the verifier is going to check. And if these are different colors, the verifier will accept. If it's the same color, it will reject. Okay, this is the entire protocol. So uh, uh, let's see what this protocol gives us. So completeness. Questions about this protocol? I know it's a funny protocol, right? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't the prover have to like commit like somehow the colors beforehand, but like secretly, so that doesn't just like always say like what is blue and what is green or something. Like Fantastic. So yeah, you said all the right buzzwords. So commit. <laughs> <laughs> so the word commitment is going to come later, but commitment is kind of the digital analog of what we're doing here. So the prover commits, it sets one coloring of the graph, which is the physical coloring of these nodes, and it cannot change it because the verifier is in the room, it cannot just like go under the... And the way, in the secrecy, the secret coloring, comes from the fact that the prover doesn't just show the verifier the coloring, it puts these black squares over the colors, so when the verifier comes in the room, it doesn't see anything. The only way the verifier can see something is if the prover chooses to remove the square. And this is exactly what commitments are going to be useful for. More questions? So I want to kind of uh, uh, wave my hands a little and tell you why this protocol is a good zero-knowledge proof protocol <laughs> in this physical model. So uh, completeness is kind of by construction. If the graph, if the graph is really colorable, the verifier will always accept. They are sound, we have some soundness from this protocol. It's not very good. Uh, 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 so we know that if the graph is not colorable, then the prover has to color at least one of the edges incorrectly. And if the prover, if the verifier chooses a random edge which is colored incorrectly, then it's going to catch the verifier. But it could be that the verifier is only cheating on one edge. So the probability that the verifier catches the prover if the graph is not colorable, all we can argue is that it's not one. It's one minus one over the number of edges. Okay. So we have some gap. Completeness, uh, the, the verifier accepts the probability one. But if the graph is not colorable, uh, uh, we have this gap of one over e. And again, once we have this gap between completeness and soundness, we can repeat this protocol sequentially many times, about maybe order of e times, until the uh, soundness error reduces below half. Uh, questions about this? OK. So it's very important that when we repeat the protocol in parallel, uh, uh, we do it uh, with fresh randomness for the prover and for the verifier. So whenever we talk about sequential repetition, uh, uh, we start the protocol, every, uh, every interaction, we start the protocol from, from scratch. The verifier chooses new coins, the prover chooses new coins. So why is it important that everybody chooses fresh coins? What happens if the prover uses the same coins in every interaction? What goes wrong? Uh, the verifier, like, figure out the color of, coloring of the whole uh, graph. Right, the zero-knowledge property kind of breaks down if you use the same random permutation of the colors, this is the randomness of the prover, it chooses a random permutation, then the verifier can keep sampling edges from this graph and see like little snippets, and eventually it can 
reconstruct the coloring of the graph. What happens if the verifier uses the same randomness again and again? So what's the randomness of the verifier? It's just the edge that it chooses to examine. So what happens? What breaks down? Soundness breaks down, right? It has to be soundness, right? the right direction. But why does soundness break down? Exactly. So if the uh, verifier uses the same edge every uh, again and again, then the prover can kind of, once it, it completed the first uh, round, which it can complete with probability maybe 1 minus 1 over e, it already knows what the edge that the verifier is looking at, and it can just target this edge. It can always color this edge correctly, and everything else can do whatever it wants. So it's very easy to uh, cheat. We don't get amplification. So we are going to use fresh randomness for the prover and verifier. So the zero knowledge property, uh, I'm not going to uh, prove it. We'll do this when we have the final protocol. But intuitively, all the verifier sees uh, in this interaction is just a pair of random colors. You remember when you look at one edge and only one edge, which is all the verifier sees in the protocol, then the two colors, these are just the distribution of the two colors is just uniform and independent uh, 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 distinct colors. So there's really nothing you can learn from this. Okay, so before we can uh, kind of write down the formal protocol, uh, 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 we're going to use uh, something called a bit commitment uh, or a commitment scheme uh, uh, that was mentioned here. So you've seen bit commitments based on chapter permutation, based on uh, one of permutations, right? So let's just recall the properties and uh, just agree on some notations. So a commitment is just a function that takes as input a bit. This is the bit that you want to commit to. It takes an input a, a randomness, which is a long random string, and it outputs a commitment. This commitment is kind of the analog of a, a locked box or a color covered by a black square. Uh, and now we want two properties from this commitment. First of all, it's statistically binding. Uh, uh, there are no uh, uh, a single commitment can never be uh, can never represent two different bits. So there are no uh, 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 there are no there are no uh, two, two random strings, R0 and R1, such that uh, the commitment to 0 with this randomness and the commitment to 1 with this randomness result in the same commitment. Okay? Once I give you a commitment, there is at most one bit that you can open it to. And the second property is a computational hiding. So if you look at the distributions of commitments to 1, with uh, uh, just a random string uh, as randomness and uh, a commitment to zero, then these two distributions are computationally indistinguishable from each other. So you cannot distinguish them uh, if you're efficient. Okay. And uh, uh, as you uh, uh, already seen, if we have one or permutations, we can construct bit commitments out of them. Just uh, uh, one last comment. Uh, here we're talking about committing to a single bit in zero one, but if you want to commit to longer messages, for example, colors, free, uh, uh, there are three colors, not just two, then uh, uh, you, can you can just use this bit commitment to commit to every bit of your message individually. Okay? And uh, uh, the binding and the hiding property are just preserved for this repetition. Questions about this? OK, so now let's see uh, how the actual protocol looks like. So the prover and verifier uh, 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 agree on some statements, some graph, G. And the prover also has a witness for the fact that this uh, graph is colorable. We think about this uh, witness as a, a function, rho, that maps uh, the vertices to colors. Just the colors are represented by 1, 2, 3. So first, uh, the prover uh, creates a permutation of this coloring. Uh, uh, it creates a new uh, function, sigma that uh, just maps the uh, vertices to 1, 2, 3, but in a random order. It just permutes the number 1, 2, 3. Uh, and then it sends the verifier uh, these hidden colors. So it just commits to every one of these colors with uh, uh, fresh randomness. So CV, for every node V, we have a commitment CV to the color of V using some random strings RV. That's OK? So now we commit it to the entire coloring. The verifier will sample a random edge. And the prover will just open the commitments of the two endpoints of this edge. So for every one of the endpoints, uh, uh, u and v, it will give us the color of this node and the randomness. 
And now the verifier can check that everything is okay. So first of all, uh, it will check that the, these openings are really consistent with the commitments for the first round. So it will check that CU is really the commitment of this color with this randomness, same for V. And also we will check that these colors come from a, 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 a good coloring, so they're different. So this is just a one-to-one -one translation of the physical protocol that we've seen before to a digital protocol using commitments instead of these black cards. So any questions about this? So let's do some uh, analysis. So we need to uh, prove three properties uh, of this protocol. So just to get you a little bit interactive, so what are the properties that we want to prove for this protocol? Three properties. This one person will say all three properties. Completeness, sadness, and zero knowledge. Okay, so uh, uh, completeness is pretty easy. Uh, if if the, uh, a graph is colorable, everything is going to uh, go smoothly. Does someone want to uh, try and help me argue soundness of this protocol? So how would you start? So what's the first sentence of the soundness proof that you would write in a homework assignment? So can someone just remind me what's the soundness property? The graph is not fully colorable, the, the probability of the verifier accepts is less than a half. Less than a half? Or okay, for one iteration. Yes. Good. So we're going to assume that we have some graph that is not colorable. And what we want to prove is that no matter what the verifier does, even if it doesn't follow the strategy, the verifier will not accept with probability too close to one. So it's going to be bounded away from one by at least the number of edges. So we have to use somehow the properties of the commitment scheme. Specifically, we're going to use the fact that this commitment is binding. We're going to use the fact that every commitment, every one of these C values, is a commitment of at most one color, okay? So now, if you look at the uh, set of these commitments, they kind of define information theoretically. You can't efficiently recover the coloring from these commitments, but they do define some color. For every one of these commitments, there is at most one color that fits, so it defines some coloring of the graph. Maybe some of the nodes are colored, uh, 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 the commitments is invalid, so we say that they're colored by some special color invalid. And because the graph is not colorable, then this coloring defined by the commitments is, is not good. There's at least one edge in this graph that is either colored uh, 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 with the same color or using colors that So now how do we complete this argument? So the prover is cheating and sending us these commitments. They define some bad coloring of the graph. Now, how do we argue that the verifier is going to detect this? If I choose the random edge, then it fails at one of your e probabilities. Right, there is at least one edge which is bad. The verifier is choosing a random edge, it's going to hit the bad edge with probability one over e. And because the prover, you know, once the commitments are out there, the prover can't do anything, then uh, 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 the verifier cannot accept uh, if it chooses this bad edge. And uh, uh, the verifier will reject with probability at least one over e. Okay. And again, we can amplify this by repeating the protocol order of one over e times sorry, order of e times, and get soundness uh, a half. Are we okay with soundness? This is repetition. Okay. So the more interesting part is how do we prove that this protocol is zero knowledge. Before we get this intuitive argument that says that all the verifier sees is kind of a pair of random colors, but now we need to actually prove this. So we need to show that uh, there exists some simulator that can accurately uh, produce the view of the verifier. So let's say that we have some verifier and we have some uh, a graph which is uh, colorable. And now we want to construct a simulator. And the main issue is that the simulator doesn't know how to color this graph. 
but still it needs to produce the view of the verifier. It needs to produce all the messages of the interaction of the verifier as if it's interacting with the prover, but it cannot just emulate what the prover does. It doesn't have the witness. It doesn't have the color. So what does the simulator do? Uh, uh, so here the, how the simulator works. First it's going to sample a random edge. Uh, we'll call it E prime V prime. This is kind of a guess of what the verifier, what edge will the verifier pick later in this protocol. So the simulator is kind of trying to cheat by maybe guessing what the verifier is going to do. What the simulator does now is it just samples two random colors for this edge. And then for every uh, uh, node that is not uh, one of the endpoints of this edge, it will just set its color to be some invalid color. You can think about a special invalid color, you can think about just one, just an arbitrary color. Okay? But the point is that it doesn't matter how you color all the other edges, because you're never going to open these commitments. Okay? So now the simulator has defined some coloring of the graph, which is really bad. It just looks good for a single edge that, it, that was chosen randomly. So now the simulator is going to pretend uh, 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 that it's in executing the proof with this coloring. And so we'll just send commitments of all these colors. And again, this is a very bad coloring of the graph. Now the verifier, uh, uh, um, we don't know how it works, but it produces some uh, edge. Maybe it's not uniformly random, but it's some edge. And now what the simulator does is as follows. It's going to check whether uh, it guessed correctly, whether the edge sampled by the verifier is really the correct edge. And if it's not, then we have, never, we have no hope of completing this interaction, we just restart. We just take the verifier, run it again with fresh coins, or, or if it doesn't take coins, we just run it from the beginning, and we uh, start the simulation from the top. We sample a new random edge, and uh, uh, we color it randomly, and we just try again. Okay. And we do this again and again, until eventually uh, we hit the right edge, and then we can just open it, right? Because this edge is colored correctly, we can open the colors for this specific edge. You know, if, if, if u prime is equal to u and v prime is equal to v, then this message will look good, and uh, uh, the verifier will uh, uh, will look at this proof and say this looks exactly like a proof the prover would give. So we're going to actually argue that uh, uh, this simulation is is valid, but before we going to all the local formal arguments is the strategy, what we're trying to do here. Does that make sense? Okay, so maybe we'll ask some questions. So uh, remember that we talked about simulation in uh, uh, expected polynomial time. So can someone tell me why this simulation is Expected polynomial time rather than strict polynomial time. No, uh, because probably uh, like the edges match is like one over e. Uh, right. If you're extremely unlucky, then the simulator can just restart the verifier again and again and never hit the right edge. But in the analysis, we're actually going to prove that this uh, 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 doesn't happen too much. So the expected running time of the simulator is polynomial. Within polynomial time, it's very likely to hit the right edge. Any other questions about how the simulation works? Why is it just a good simulation? But the simulator needs to know the like, commitment function. So the commitment function is a completely public function. Everybody knows it. It's part of the def definition of the protocol. It's just like uh, uh, it's using a, a, a one representation, just like you've seen in class. What, the, uh, uh, what is hidden about this commitment function is what randomness you use. So the uh, party that chooses this randomness is the simulator in this case. Okay, it chooses all the random strings for the commitment. So when it's time to open some of the commitments, the simulator knows how to open. So does the simulator uses the, the commitment function in this process? Yeah, after it samples the sigma, it actually creates a message that consists of all the commitments to all the colors. So it uses the commitment function to compute these commitments. And then it just takes this message and feeds it into the verifier. So it's basically simulating the view of the verifier, the messages that are sent to the verifier. But the simulator might use a different randomness from the proof. Right. So in the definition of zero knowledge, we don't require that the simulated proof and the real proof are identical bit by bit. We think about the simulated proof and the real proof as random variables. 
They depend on the randomness of the simulator and the randomness of the prover. And we want to say that as random variables, they're indistinguishable. Their distributions are either identical or they look the same. So as long as the simulator is choosing this randomness for the commitment from the same distribution as the prover, will be good. Right? In this, in this case, this distribution is just random string. Yeah. Okay, so when you repeat it and restart, yeah. are you actually sending something new? Are you sending new commitments? Or were you? Yes. So, 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 so I'll say two things. So first of all, this is all a, an experiment that is happening inside the simulator. The simulator is not really talking to any real verifier. The simulator is just a machine. So, the simulator is just a, an algorithm that is supposed to output a, a, the same thing that the verifier does. So what it does is it internally takes the code of the verifier and uh, it produces this uh, first message and it just runs this algorithm with this message. So it's pretending to have a conversation with some verifier, but it's doing it inside its code. So it's emulating the verifier. So once it completes, uh, 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 it gets a message. If this is a bad message, then it says, I'm restarting. I'm just like erasing everything that just happened. I'm taking this algorithm and starting it again from scratch and setting fresh commitment with fresh randomness, everything fresh. So all these sample and these random choices are happening again. So why can't you just like assume that the first time you got the right UV? So you don't know how the verifier behaves. It's, you cannot control, I mean, you can give it randomness, but the verifier is cheating. It might ignore the randomness you give it and just sample Maybe it always samples the same age. It can do that. You can do whatever you want. So you may, you really have no idea. Not only that, the, 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 the edge that you send here, it can depend on some complicated function on the commitment that you send here. So this verifier is cheating. It can decide to apply some weird function to these commitments and choose this edge accordingly. We have no idea how this edge is computed. We might not guess it correctly. We actually need to find messages that fit together. That you know, if we send this message, we get we really get this message. We can't just pretend that the verifier sends the different messages because the verifier would never send this message. It actually sends a different. One. Okay, more. Okay, so let's see the proof, and uh, I hope that you know zooming into the details will make things more clear instead of uh, more confusing. But let's see. So this is what we need to prove. For every uh, a, a non-uniform verifier, V star, the uh, distribution of uh, the view of the verifier, the output of the verifier, uh, when interacting with the real prover, is indistinguishable from, uh, um, from what the simulator produced. And uh, uh, we're thinking about ex executing this on graphs that are uh, in the language, that are colorable. And the second thing that we need to show is that the simulator runs an expected coin on real time. So this is what we need to prove just the definition. And the way we're going to prove this, our strategy, will be to look at uh, something called a hybrid simulator. So it will be just a, a fake experiment, a thought experiment, that uh, is going to bridge these two distributions together. So we're going to think about a, a, a new simulator, S prime, which kind of looks like the simulator, but it's cheating. This simulator is not only given the graph, it's actually given the coloring of this graph. So it's trying to simulate a, a proof, but it knows the witness. It's very easy to simulate a proof once you know the witness. You can actually give a real proof. But this is not really the simulator that we care about. What we care about is this final, this real simulator, which we just defined. This simulator will just be an experiment in the analysis to show that the simulator and this prover are actually the same. Okay? So we're going to look at three distributions. And we're going to show that every two of them are computationally distinguishable. This is computationally distinguishable, and this one. And uh, uh, so let me uh, just tell you how this fake uh, uh, simulator S prime uh, works. So now this S prime, it actually knows the coloring rule of the graph. And it will behave kind of similar to the actual prover, but also similar to the, uh, uh, similar to the simulator, somewhere in the middle. So we will choose a random edge, just like the simulator, and it will sample random colors for this random edge. But then it will set the rest of the coloring, not just to just, to just arbitrary bad colors. <coughs> it will set the rest of the coloring of the rest of the graph to be a valid coloring that is consistent with the random colors that it chose for this one edge. <coughs> so 
you remember we said that if you have the coloring of the graph and you choose one and you choose one edge randomly, you can kind of complete this coloring into a valid coloring of the entire graph, right? So this is exactly what's happening here. Is this step clear? Because it's kind of confusing. You kind of sample backwards what's supposed to be the coloring that will explain this uh, uh, random edge, the colors of the random edge that you chose here. So first you choose the random edge, then you fix the rest of the coloring to be consistent with it. And then it just uh, uh, continues to uh, uh, interact just like the simulator. It sends a commitment to this coloring, it gets a random edge. If it's not the edge that uh, 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 was intended, then it restarts the verifier and does the whole thing again. So the hybrid simulator is clear, it's kind of doing something weird, it's, it has a coloring but it doesn't really use it, it's kind of trying to pretend to be the simulator. So what we need to prove is it uh, uh, can be broken down into the following <coughs> four statements. In the first part we show that S prime and S are actually similar, so they produce the same output distribution and, uh, uh, and, they run, and the running time is almost the same. Okay? So this is one side. Uh, on the other side, we want to show that the simulator S prime is also similar to the prover, and uh, here we'll also show that S prime really runs an expected polynomial time. So if you take these four statements together, you get that in fact the real simulation and the real prover uh, 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 produce the same distribution, and that the simulator runs in polynomial time. Is it everybody with me on these four statements being enough? Why do we need S prime and S to run all at the same time? Because all we're going to show is that S prime runs in expected polynomial time, but what we need to show is that S runs in expected polynomial time. This is the actual simulator that we care about. So put these two statements together, you get that S runs in expected polynomial time. This is just our proof strategy. Okay. We could have proven this directly, like something directly about S. Instead, we're going to prove it about S prime and then deduce about S. So I'm going, not going to go into all the details, but I'm giving you kind of the a, a structure of the proof, and uh, kind of filling in the details should be uh, pretty easy for you. So the first thing that uh, we look at is uh, we put the simulator next to the uh, uh, fake simulator S and S prime, and we look what's the difference. So we notice that the difference is just what are the colors that you commit to, uh, uh, except for uh, the colors of this one edge. So for this one edge, we have just exactly the same distribution, random distribution. But in one case, we uh, uh, we color everything uh, with a bad color. In the other case, we color everything with a good coloring. And then we send the verifier commitments of all these colors. So really, the only difference, and then the rest of the simulation is exactly the same. So the only difference between the real simulator and the fake simulator is what's inside these commitments that we send the verifier. Okay. But these commitments are hiding. So if, only, if the, all, only, the only thing we change between S and S prime is the value inside these commitments, then these two distributions will be computationally indistinguishable from each other exactly because of the, com because of the uh, 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 computational hiding property of the commitment. Okay. So when you do the reduction, you say, if there is someone that can distinguish the output of S from the output of S prime, or if the running times of S and N prime are significantly different, then you can use either of these differences to actually break the commitment scheme. How do you do that? You just emulate one of these simulators, uh, both of these simulators, S and S prime, and when it's time to send the commitments, you're sending the commitments either for bad colors or for good colors, and uh, based on the result, you can kind of deduce which one of these commitments you set. You can kind of understand what was inside the commitments. So is that the, the reduction to the hiding of the commitment, does that make sense? I'll just say that if you're writing this proof down, because there are many commitments here, you have to do uh, this proof by a sequence of a lot of hybrids. You can't just take all the commitments and change them from good coloring to bad coloring. You have to do a sequence of uh, e, color, e hybrids. In every hybrid, you change one commitment. Did you get a chance to do this kind of hybrid argument where you change many commitments or many encryptions in homework or something like that? Looks really good. Good, so we're okay on one and two, right? Okay, so to prove uh, three and four, we're going to go back to our uh, 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 si fake simulator, S prime, 
So this is just the code of S prime together with the messages that it sends. Okay, this is just the entire execution in one column. And now we're going to uh, start stating some claims about the execution of the simulator. So my first claim is that if you look just at the first message, this is the commitment, then this message is actually uh, distributed exactly like the first message in a real proof. Right? This message just consists of commitments to a random uh, permutation of the coloring. So the prover will just choose a random permutation of the coloring, the simulator will first choose a random edge, then chooses random colorings, then completes the coloring. But these are just two different ways to sample the same distribution, just random permutations of the colors. <coughs> so when you commit to these colors, you get exactly the same distribution in the real proof and in the simulated proof. You believe me on this? My second claim is that uh, uh, now, if you look at the entire execution, but you condition on uh, the verifier choosing some specific edge. So in this experiment, the verifier will choose some, uh, a specific, every edge E with some probability. Let's fix some edge that the verifier chooses and look at all, uh, 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 all the uh, interactions, all the views in the support of this random variable where the verifier chooses the specific edge. And let's do the same with the simulator. You know, the simulator is also running the verifier internally. The verifier is choosing some edge. Let's focus only on the cases where the verifier chooses some specific edge. Okay. I'm saying that once you fix, once you condition on this edge being chosen, then these two distributions, the actual proof and the, and the uh, proof produced by S prime, are also exactly the same. So the first message is the same. The second message is just always E. And the last message is just an opening of E to two random colors. So if you just focus on one challenge, one verifier challenge, these two distributions are the same, right? Can we prove this? We're not going to prove this, but uh, uh, you should be able to prove this by yourself. If you feel like you won't be able to do this, then maybe it's a good time to think about it a little more and maybe ask a question. So now we're going to start using this claim to deduce what we need. So first of all, I'm arguing that even if you don't condition on a specific edge, the distributions here are just uh, 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 the same. The distribution of uh, the simulated proof by S prime and the real proof. What's the reason? So the verifier uh, 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 chooses what edge it's going to sample as a function of its randomness and the first message that it sees. Now the first message that it sees is distributed exactly the same here and here. This is just claim one. So the distribution of the second message is also going to be exactly the same. So now we know that for every specific message that the verifier is choosing, the distribution of the entire proof looks good. So if you just average out all these distributions, uh, uh, giving the right coefficients for every edge, the probability that we see every edge, you have that these uh, two distributions are uh, uh, identical even if the verifier chooses the edge randomly or according to whatever distribution it's coming from. So is this clear? So you're basically just combining all these distributions for all these different edges based on the distribution of the verifier is child. Is that okay? Also, uh, we have that the running time of the verifier uh, uh, is a, a, a polynomial time in expectation. And the reason is that the verifier is choosing this edge, this challenge edge, and uh, uh, in some way, all it sees is this first message. Now the first message, it may seem like it depends on this edge, uh, u prime, v prime, but it's actually independent of this edge. Remember, it's, it looks exactly the same as the message from, that the actual prover sent. And the actual prover doesn't pick a random edge. It just sends a color. So this message contains no information about the edge u prime, v prime, and since this edge is, is, is sampled randomly and there's no information here, then with probability 1 over e, these two edges are going to be, we're going to guess the edge correctly. The verifier can't kind of like see what edge we are guessing and choose something else. It doesn't have no information about what our guess is. So at some point our guess is going to be correct. 
So this happens with probability one over e, which means that after a, a, a roughly e tries an expectation, we're going to get a, a complete this proof. <coughs> okay. So we're good with three and four. Again, you should be able to prove all of this by yourself by following this sequence of claims. Okay, great. So, uh, uh, so this actually completes the analysis, completes the protocol. And I want to uh, just conclude this first part of the talk by uh, uh, mentioning some open questions uh, about zero knowledge for NP. So do you have any questions before we conclude? About anything to discuss? Okay. So one uh, uh, important uh, uh, question about zero knowledge is uh, uh, the question of repetition. So as we mentioned, if we want to get the soundness error down, and we really do because we started with the protocol with very bad soundness, you know, with probability almost one, the prover can cheat. If we want to get this down to half or even to negligible, we need to repeat. And I only show you how to simulate one execution. So how do you simulate the repeated protocol, the entire protocol? Maybe the entire protocol leaks more information. So the way you simulate the entire protocol is very similar to the way you simulate just one copy. So instead of just, you simulate the first copy of the, of, the, of, the, of the proof, and then you continue to the second copy. If something goes wrong, if you don't guess correctly in the second copy, you don't restart everything, because this will be too much work. You'll never get through the entire protocol. You just restart the verifier up to the point where it starts the second execution. And then you can just uh, uh, do this again and again for every round. And more generally, you know, this is kind of looking at this specific protocol and seeing that this strategy works. But more generally, whenever you repeat a zero knowledge protocol uh, 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 sequentially many times, then it's enough to show zero knowledge for one of the executions against non uniform verifiers. And uh, uh, you can either prove this as an exercise or, or you can open a book about zero knowledge. And a really important open question is what happens if we uh, repeat the protocol, if we amplify the soundness, not by repeating the protocol sequentially, by repeating many copies of the protocol with independent randomness, but in parallel. So when we repeat things sequentially, we kind of blow up the number of rounds. We have to communicate many, uh, uh, many uh, rounds back and forth. Uh, the better soundness error we want, the more communication we need. We need at least uh, uh, as much rounds as the size of the graph. So what happens if we're just trying to uh, repeat things in parallel? So this is a really good question. Uh, the short answer is that it's really not clear. Uh, uh, we don't really have like devastating attacks on this protocol where we repeat in parallel. But we also don't know how to prove that zero knowledge. We don't know how to construct a simulator. In fact, we have some good <coughs> evidence that we will not be able to construct a simulator even if we try. On the other hand, it turns out that this idea of parallel repetition is very useful because it does give us a protocol uh, 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 with maybe meaningful properties. Maybe we don't have simulation, but maybe we have other meaningful properties, uh, uh, other meaningful security properties that we can get out of this parallel repetition. And I think this is something that you're going to uh, kind of explore yourself in the problem set. So this is the first question. Uh, uh, it's still uh, largely open what is, wh what's going on when we repeat these type of protocols in parallel. Uh, the second question is, what's the minimal round complexity of zero-knowledge proofs? So this is really related to the first question. If we can repeat a protocol in parallel, this is a very good way to reduce the round complexity and get something with maybe three rounds or something like this. But we don't know if power repetition works. So now a larger question is whether there is some alternative way to get a constant round protocol. Turns out that the answer is yes. But if you want to go all the way down to three rounds, like in the parallel repetition, this is already an open question. And Till this day, we don't really uh, understand completely what is the right round complexity of zero-knowledge proofs. How many rounds do we need to interact back and forth to prove something in zero-knowledge? Uh, um, and the last, mention I'll, uh, the last question I want to mention is this question of statistical simulation. So in our definition of zero-knowledge, we wanted the views of the, prover and the uh, uh, views of the real proof and the simulated proof to be computationally indistinguishable from each other. They cannot be distinguished by an efficient distinguisher. So if you remember the uh, protocol that you saw for quadratic residuosity, then you were able to prove something even stronger. Then you were able, to, there you were, you were able to prove that the uh, views of the real proof and the simulated proof are identical. They cannot even be distinguished by an all-powerful distinguisher. So the question is whether we can get a protocol not just for quadratic residuosity, for all of NP, 
where this uh, uh, simulation is uh, uh, statistical. It holds against unbounded distinguisher. Um, so we can do this if we uh, if we relax the soundness properties. If we want better to, if we want better simulation, we can uh, do this by giving up something on the soundness. We'll, uh, we can compromise on something called an argument, something uh, with uh, with computational soundness. So an all an all powerful prover can maybe cheat, but an efficient prover will not be able to cheat. Uh, uh, whether we can get statistical simulation uh, without compromising on soundness, whether we can get perfect soundness and perfect simulation together for all of NP, we don't know. We, we kind of suspect that the answer is no, but this, there's still research questions here. Okay, questions about the questions. More questions. Okay, great. So this area is kind of uh, uh, 35 years old or something like this, and there's still a lot of open questions for research. Okay, so we're moving on to kind of uh, something completely different. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a, a yet another property of interactive proofs of zero knowledge protocols called uh, a proof of knowledge. We're going to talk about zero knowledge proofs of knowledge. And uh, uh, this will be our subject uh, until the end of the lecture. So kind of uh, uh, take in everything you know about the free coloring protocol, put it aside, and uh, now we're going to talk about uh, uh, proofs of knowledge. So I'm going to introduce a new property of zero-knowledge protocols. And uh, uh, before I introduce it, I just want to give you some motivation. Why do we care about this property? So this motivation comes from one of the uh, first applications of zero-knowledge. When zero-knowledge was introduced, this is one of the first applications that was suggested. This is, why, uh, this is what you can do with a zero-knowledge protocol. It's called uh, an identification protocol. So how do I uh, identify myself? How do I prove to others online that uh, uh, I am who I say I am. And of course, we use identification protocol all the time. Whenever you log into some uh, 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 service, you prove your identity just, uh, uh, just to protect yourself and to protect whatever information is on the service. So this is what uh, an identification protocol looks like. Alice wants to identify it herself. It has uh, some uh, uh, secret key that it n is known only to her. And Bob is uh, uh, maybe her email server, maybe uh, uh, just a website, that, uh, uh, or maybe someone that wants to verify Alice's identity. So Alice also has a, a public key that is a, a public. Every, everyone knows that this is Alice's public key. And Bob can use this public key to verify the, uh, uh, Alice's identity. So as long as uh, 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 Alice keeps her secret key to herself, nobody else can identify it. So Alice and Bob will run this uh, identification protocol. And the purpose here is for Alice to convince Bob that she's really the owner of the secret key. But Alice also wants to maintain her privacy. She wants to make sure that anyone that's listening in on this conversation, or even Bob, if it's not following the protocol or if it's trying to learn more than it's supposed to, nobody that's uh, 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 other than Alice can learn the secret key. And that is the case even if Alice uses this identification protocol many times with many different parties. So the motivation is clear. This is what we're trying to do. So here is a, a common example for how we construct these identification protocols, uh, uh, the common settings uh, 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 that is used a lot in practice. So uh, we're going to base our protocol on a, a cyclic a multiplicative group G uh, of order Q with a generator G. Is that sentence we parse it? So we take powers of this generator G and uh, 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 if we multiply G with itself Q times, we kind of cover all the secret group. So now Alice is going to have a secret key, which is just an exponent, a random exponent uh, uh, between 1 and Q. And uh, the public key is going to be uh, uh, G to the X. So X is the secret key. The public key is Y, which is G to the X. So uh, in this type, uh, if the group is large enough, uh, uh, or if you're using the right group, we know that it's hard to uh, find x given j to the x. This is a one-way function. So given the public key, it's hard to find the secret key. And now Alice is going to use what's called, a, 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 we'll use a, a, a zero-knowledge proof to prove that a, a, a y is really a public key. So there exists an x such that g to the x is equal to y. y is really, uh, x is really the discrete log of x. x is really the discrete log of y. So we're using uh, 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 the 
the soundness of this proof so that Bob can really be convinced that Alice uh, has the right secret key. And we're using the zero knowledge property to protect Alice, to make sure that uh, X is not revealed in this protocol. X is kind of the witness here. Okay, so uh, we already seen some uh, zero knowledge proofs for quadratic residuosity for, for all of NP using coloring. And uh, here I'm going to give you a, an example for yet another zero knowledge proof that uh, is kind of tailored to the setting. Uh, it's actually a really simple zero knowledge proof. It goes something like this, it just has one round. So uh, there exists an x such as v to the x equal to y, just trust me. That is the proof. And I'm claiming that uh, uh, this is a good zero knowledge proof. So first of all, it's zero knowledge, it's complete. The verifier always accepts, the proof of Bob always accepts. Okay, this is part of the, of the proof. Uh, it's zero knowledge, it doesn't convey any information about x. This is a kind of straightforward proof. And, uh, and I'm claiming that it's also sound, okay? So does anyone have any objections to, to the soundness of this protocol? Someone think this protocol is maybe not sound? So everybody agrees that it's a good protocol. We, we, can, we can fast forward to the last slide. So, so can someone tell me maybe why is this not a sound protocol? Is there any problems? Yeah. Some people are shaking I their head no. Say just trust me. What? Even if you don't have, even if it's not a power event, any bad. Proof. So you're saying that this protocol is not sound, so I'm just going to flash the definition of soundness. We want that for every full statement Y, for every uh, statement where there is no witness, then Alice cannot convince Paul. So it, the problem here is that for every y there exists some x, such that g to the x is equal to y. So every y is a true statement. There are no false statements. So the soundness error just holds vacuously. No, there's no false statement. Soundness holds. This is a perfectly good protocol. So there's nothing wrong with what I said. This is a really good zero knowledge uh, uh, protocol. It's zero knowledge. It's sound. It's complete. The problem here is not with the uh, uh, protocol. The problem here is with the definitions. We're using the wrong definitions. We don't really care about soundness. What we care about here is that Alice don't only proves that Y is a true statement. This is trivial and known to all. What Alice needs to prove is that it knows what the witness is. It really knows what the discrete log is. It knows X. So before we were arguing about uh, knowledge from the other direction. Alice has some knowledge, but it doesn't want to reveal it to uh, 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 Bob. Now we're asking about knowledge in the other direction. We want to actually prove that not only the statement is correct, but Alice possesses the knowledge of why the statement is correct. What is the witness? Okay? So we're taking this knowledge game and kind of twisting it around. And as you see, what we need in actual protocols is really related to this notion of a, a proof of knowledge. We really need to prove that we know a, 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 what the secret key is. Otherwise, our identification protocol makes no sense. So I'm going to formalize this proof of knowledge property. So again, proof of knowledge property is just an alternative property that we uh, uh, use instead of soundness. It's stronger than soundness, and it captures the fact that the prover uh, uh, actually needs to know the witness that it's using. So let me kind of uh, uh, formalize this a bit. So we uh, uh, require that for every uh, uh, efficient cheating prover, and for every uh, constant epsilon, uh, uh, there exists some extractor, E, which is also efficient, such that for every statement that the prover is trying to uh, 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 convince the verifier of, the statement could be true, false, for any statement. If the prover is convincing the verifier to accept the statement with probability that is more than half, half plus epsilon, then this means that our extractor will be able to actually produce a witness for the state. So we uh, will allow this extractor to kind of uh, uh, depend on the prover and depend on this bound epsilon. So the running time of the extractor can depend on maybe one over epsilon. This is what we'll uh, eventually get. And, um, and uh, we also allow the extractor to run an expected polynomial time. So it can, uh, the expected, uh, it can run many times and uh, 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 it needs to, uh, the expected running time of the extractor should be uh, roughly, uh, will be roughly one over epsilon. So, uh, so this is the definition, just to get some intuition about this, 
let me uh, uh, sketch the argument. Why is this a stronger definition than soundness? Why proof of knowledge actually guarantees soundness? So any protocol that satisfies this proof of knowledge property will always be sound. Why? So say that the statement x is not true. It's not in the language. But the prover still is still able to convince the verifier to accept with probability more than half. So this means that the extractor has to produce a witness for the statement. But the statement is false. So there is no witness. So conversely, this means that the prover will not be able to convince the verifier with probability more than half. And this is our original soundness property. Okay. But here we're requiring more. We're requiring that every uh, uh, cheating prover that convinces uh, uh, the verifier of some statement has this alter ego called the extractor that actually produces the knowledge, the internal knowledge of the prover, produces the witness. Okay? So you can think about this extractor as an efficient machine that kind of it, it, it extracts out what the prover knows, just like the simulator is an efficient machine that extracts out what the verifier knows. Before we were trying to argue that the verifier knows nothing, now we're trying to argue that the prover knows the witness. Questions about this definition? Okay, so now, just for fun and uh, to kind of uh, exercise this definition, we're going to see yet another zero knowledge protocol. It's going to be a, a, have a lot of similarities to the uh, several protocols we've already seen. And this one is going to be a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for discrete law. So it's going to satisfy completeness, zero knowledge. And not only will it satisfy soundness, it will satisfy the stronger proof of knowledge required. And again, what we're trying, so we have a prover and verifier, and what uh, the prover is trying to convince, the, the, they both agree on some statement, why? And the prover is trying to convince the verifier that it knows x such that y is equal to g to the x. So here is the, uh, uh, so we want to construct a zero knowledge proof of knowledge uh, uh, for the statement. So here, uh, 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 how this protocol is going to work. So first of all, the prover will sample some random exponent it has nothing to do with x, uh, and we'll, we'll call it small r, and it will send g to the r, this uh, uh, will be uh, denoted by capital R. Okay? So capital R is just a random uh, uh, element in this group, and the prover knows the discrete log of r. It's just small r. Of course, the verifier doesn't know small r. So now what the prover is going to argue in the rest of the protocol, and we'll state it first informally, then we'll fill in the details. The prover will uh, convince the verifier that it knows both the discrete log of r and the discrete log of y times r. So of course the discrete log of y is just the difference between these two exponents. So if you know both of them, this means that you also know the discrete log of y, right? So the prover will convince the verifier that it knows both of these exponents, but it will not reveal both of them, because this uh, it will give out all the knowledge, it will give out x. It will just reveal one of them, and this is the kind of standard trick that we uh, 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 already know and love. From, it is kind of apparent somewhere in all the zero-knowledge protocols that we've seen. So how uh, is this? Let's get the slide. Okay, so it looks like I skipped a slide. I'll just uh, write down the protocol uh, on the board. So yeah, so uh, can everybody see here? The right. So we have a prover and a verifier. The prover, uh, and we have some statement y that is equal to g of x. The prover starts by sending uh, r, which is g to the r. Another verifier uh, uh, will sample a random bit b. and send it to the prover. So this b is just a, a, a choice bit of the verifier that says, I want to see the discrete log of r, or I want to see the discrete log of uh, y times r. Okay. So now the prover is going to answer accordingly. It's going to send a, a which is equal to a, a x times b plus r. So if you set b equal to 0, you get the discrete log of r. If you set b is equal to 1, you get the discrete log of uh, y times r, which is x plus small r. Is this protocol clear? The intuition is clear. So the verifier will choose to see one of these uh, uh, random. It will never see uh, 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 both of them. 
So either b is equal to 0 or b is equal to 1. So this protocol, uh, to prove that this protocol is zero knowledge, we kind of follow the same steps that we did in the uh, free common protocol and the quadratic velocity protocol. Um, so we have until 55. 55. Five minutes. Good. Have enough time. So to prove that this protocol is zero knowledge, we kind of follow the same steps. We show that the first message. Uh, 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 so the simulator is just trying to guess what the verifier's bit is going to be. And then uh, uh, it chooses uh, 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 the first message accordingly, so it knows what the last message is going to be. And then we kind of follow the same steps in the proof that we've seen in quadratic residuosity and uh, in the coloring protocol. You should be able to kind of copy the same steps to this protocol, and it will work just fine. What I am going to show you is how to prove that uh, this protocol is a real, is, is a good proof of knowledge. So before we kind of glance over the zero knowledge property, does anyone have any doubts about their ability to prove that this protocol is zero knowledge? Or maybe you think that it's not zero knowledge? So let's see why this is a good uh, 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 proof of knowledge. So say that we have some cheating prover that uh, manages to convince the verifier to accept some statement Y with probability more than half, half plus epsilon for some constant epsilon. So now our extractor, uh, which is the algorithm that's supposed to produce the witness for y, the discrete log, will run this prover twice using the same randomness. It will pick a random tape for, a random tape for the prover, and uh, it will run the prover twice with the same random tape. Okay? The prover is a probabilistic machine. It takes some coins. We'll just run it with the same coins, which means that the prover will produce the same first message r. We don't know if the prover knows the discrete log of R. We don't know anything, but it produces some message. And now we're going to uh, 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 place both of these executions with two different challenges. Once we'll set zero, once we'll set one. And we hope that the prover actually gives us a good response in both of these executions. Of course, the prover doesn't have to answer uh, correctly in both of them. It can answer correctly maybe in one of them or none of them. But first, let me argue that if we get a good answer in both of these executions, then we're set. So a good answer for, a, 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 for b equals 1 is some a exponent a1 such that g to the a1 is a, a y times r. And here we get a0 such that a0 is the discrete log of r. So if we get good answers, accepting answers in both of these transcripts, then we can a, a, a learn the value of x is just a1 minus a0 modulo q. So of course, uh, 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 it might be the case that we're not getting a good answer in both of these cases. And uh, in this case, we'll just rewind to the beginning. And we'll try again. We'll try to run p twice with, a different, uh, 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 with different coins. So now I argue that because the prover is uh, convincing the verifier to accept this probability significantly more than half, maybe three quarters, then for some good fraction, or no noticeable fraction of the random tapes for p stars, it will have to hope to produce a good proof for both 0 and 1. If for every random tape it only answers uh, uh, either for 0 or for 1, then it will never succeed to convince the verifier with probability more than half. So this means that after uh, roughly 1 over epsilon uh, uh, tries an expectation, we're going to get a good uh, uh, output in both of these executions, and we can extract the value of x. Yeah? What if 1 over epsilon is super common? So, good. In our definition, epsilon is just constant. Oh, okay. So 1 over epsilon is also constant. <laughs> but you are right in the sense that what we actually want is to push this as much as possible, and uh, the answer is that we can get a meaningful proof of knowledge property as long as the uh, prover succeeds with probability that is noticeably larger than the soundness there. So as long as the gap between the soundness and the uh, success probability of the prover is like one over some polynomial, we can succeed because epsilon is one over epsilon is polynomial, and we can run in polynomial. More questions about this? So this is the last slide, so you can like, take on all the questions. Zero minutes to go, zero questions. No, one question. Do we know that every problem in has a good problem? 
Right, yeah, good question. So the uh, protocol, so it's a very simple exercise to show that roughly the same analysis shows that the free coloring protocol is uh, a proof of knowledge for all of NP. The reason to look at this protocol is just because it's kind of uh, cleaner, it's also statistical zero knowledge, uh, it also has the proof of knowledge pro property called against. So there's really no reason to insist on this protocol. You can just use the protocol. Okay, great. Thank you.